welcome to the At Percussion Podcast. This is episode number 338. Uh, this will be released on October 27th, 2022, if my math is correct. <laughs> um, I'm Ben Charles, and with me, as always, are Ksenia Kaminovic. Hey, Ksenia, how's it going? Hey, Ben. It's going well. How are you? I'm doing well, just uh, keeping busy, trying to stay awake these days. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, know, those two AM games, they are crazy. Yeah, right? oh God. yeah, we had a we had a football game over the weekend and I got to bed at two thirty AM when we got back from the uh the bus ride. So and the uh lovely Carly Vigna. How are you, Carly? Well thanks for that introduction, Ben. I'm good at I didn't have any two thirty AM uh bedtimes after football games in the last <laughs> twenty years at least. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> Well, as I mentioned, this episode's being released on October 27th. So, Carly, what happened in history on October 27th? Yeah, a couple of interesting things, actually. In um, 1950, on October 27th, it was the premiere of Paul Creston's Third Symphony. Anybody ever hear this piece? Anybody know anything about Paul Creston other than his marimba concertino? I was like, I know him. I know he, he tended to feature unusual instruments, or at least unusual at the time, like trombone and harp, I think were two of the ones. Well, that there's the, the sax concerto or sonata, maybe, and the, the marimba concertino, of course. That's kind of all, all I knew about it. So this popped up when I searched history for October 27th, and I was like, hmm. So I'll tell you a little bit about Paul Creston's Third Symphony. It's in three movements. Um, each one depicts uh, one aspect of the life of Christ. The first movement is the nativity. The second movement is the crucifixion, and the third movement is the resurrection. And this was premiered in 1950 by uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra, which was led at the time by Eugene Ormandy. And the whole piece, the musical themes are derived from or inspired by a Gregorian chant. So, for example, the main theme in the first movement, which is introduced by the horn, is derived from an ancient Gregorian alleluia. So I realized when reading about this and reading about Paul Creston that um, I know the Creston marimba concertino really well, but I really don't know very much about him. So Paul Creston was actually born uh, Giuseppe Guttavegio in 1906 in New York City to Sicilian immigrants. And he was self-taught as a composer and was one of the most performed American composers in the 1940s and 1950s. And several of his works have become staples of wind, bear, wind band repertoire Although I've not played any of these or heard them, I don't think Zanoni, Prelude and Dance, or Celebration Overture are common wind pieces that he composed. Um, I think I might have played Celebration Overture, but yeah, that's, yeah, they don't get performed that much, it seems, compared to a Granger or something like that. Right, yeah. Yeah, so the, the other big thing that happened on this date, October 27th, um, in 1940, was that it's the birthday of composer Julius Eastman, who was an American pianist, vocalist, and minimalist composer. He was born in New York City, and he died in 1990. Um, and this relates really loosely to Creston's premiere. I don't know if I mentioned, but the third symphony is subtitled, Creston's third symphony is si subtitled Triumph of St. Joan. And um, Julius Eastman happened to have written a piece called The Holy Presence of Joan of Arc in 1981. So there's a little bit of connection beyond October 27th. Um, let's see, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about Julius Eastman. Um, he was an American minimalist, minimalist composer and also a pianist, a vocalist and performance artist. And he was especially known for combining minimalism with elements of pop music. He grew up in Ithaca, New York and began studying the piano at age 14. And he studied at Ithaca College before transferring to Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, where he studied both piano and composi composition, but then switched majors from piano to composition and graduated in 1963. Um, and he made his debut as a pianist in 1966 at the Town Hall in New York City. He, had, he was known for his really rich, deep, and also flexible singing voice. Um, that was really well recognized after his 1973 recording of Eight Songs for a Mad King by Peter Maxwell Davies, a British composer. Um, so he performed extensively throughout the 70s with uh, Peter Kotick, who was a Czech foreign composer, conductor, and also a flutist, and was a founding member of the SEM Ensemble. The two of them founded this together in New York City. Um, Eastman was also a member of the Creative Associates, 
which, which was a prestigious program in avant-garde classical music that carried a stipend but no teaching obligations at SUNY Buffalo Center for the Creative and Performing Arts. Think about that, a stipend with no teaching obligations. Um, some of Eastman's works are really provocatively titled with some themes of homosexuality and racism. Uh, some of those titles I won't say on air. And uh, some of his performances were also controversial. Reportedly, Eastman had a bit of a conflict with John Cage after the SEM ensemble that he co-founded performed uh, Cage's songbooks. And the performance had elements of nudity and homoeroticism, um, which judging by what I read, Cage really didn't appreciate as part of the piece. So I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what happened there. Um, but what, what we might know him for is flexible instrumentation, uh, minimalist work called Stay On It is one of the most commonly performed works that I hear of of Eastman's being performed today. Um, this was premiered by his group, The Creative Associates in 1973. And So Percussion has a video of this. They made it as part of the So Percussion Collaborative Workshop in 2021. Um, kind of an online, one of those conglomerate, everybody records their parts and pieces it together. And then Alarm Will Sound has a nice video on YouTube of this piece as well. So if you feel so inclined, um, there are two listening suggestions from this week's history segment. You can go and listen to Stay On It by Julius Eastman um, or Paul Creston's Symphony Number no. 3, or maybe both of those. Paul Creston is a really uh, interesting figure for us because obviously he wrote the, the first Marimba Concerto, but does anyone know how he worked out the Marimba Concerto, like how he composed it? Have you heard no. this story? He played no. the orchestra parts with his hands on the organ and the marimba part with his feet on the organ, which I can't imagine. The third movement's very fast. I'm sure it wasn't up to tempo, but still, that's <laughs> pretty nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Considering how hard it is to like have a note perfect, nailing it kind of performance of just yeah. <laughs> with two hands and two mallets. Yeah, it's got fast feet. Well, thanks so much, Carly. That was that was awesome. Well done. Um, we would like to welcome to the podcast for t for today now our guest, uh, Miss Jalissa Gasho from uh, the Yamaha Corporation. Jalissa is the manager of artist relations and education for the Yamaha Artist Relations Group in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, she joined the Yamaha Corporation of America's team in Indianapolis in 2012 after graduating from Taylor University with a degree in music marketing. And she's also a passionate advocate for inclusion, equity, and the celebration of diversity through the arts. She's served on the board of directors for ArtSpeak, the board of advisors for the Harrison Center's Independent Music and Arts Festival, and as a mentor for the North American Saxophone Alliance's Gender Equity Committee Mentoring Program. So welcome to the podcast, Jalissa. Thank you. So fun to be with you guys tonight. So great to have you here. Um, I met Jalissa for the first time in uh, about a year ago in November at PASIC. So it's nice to, to get to catch up again here. Um, so Jalissa, I, I, as I mentioned, met you through Yamaha. And uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you as we talk about careers in music industry today is um, what drew you to Yamaha? What, what made you want to work for this company in particular? Sounds like a uh, job interview a, question. <laughs> yeah, it totally does. Tell me why you want to work here. No, it's such a good question. And that like that question always stumps people, I think, in interviews. So that's a good one to have an answer for if you're going into an interview, why you want to work for the company. I honestly, you know, I, I knew that Yamaha existed. I played a Yamaha saxophone and marching band in high school um, and played Yamaha pianos through college, but didn't necessarily know about the company itself and um, kind of just stumbled upon the job application application through my academic advisor, um, who are great resources um, at your universities. Um, he happened to find the link to the job application online, which took me down a whole rabbit trail of obviously researching the company and the values and um, was able to then ask a lot of questions through the interview process about the company and the philosophies and really um, you know, thankfully I got the job, but even in that that time, knowing that I had played these pianos for so many years and, and other instruments, um, to feel like there was something behind the company that I resonated with on a deeper level was really satisfying, I think, um, in terms of, you know, a green practices and caring for the environment all the way to really how instruments are designed and the philosophy behind all of that 
um, stuff. So really, honestly, I, it, it was more that the job found me and then I researched the company, which I don't think always necessarily happens, um, but, but certainly does. And I'm, I'm grateful for the path that, that um, brought me to Yamaha. And um, those are the things that still keep me here is the deep philosophy and understanding of what the company cares, cares about and the practice they put behind the words that they say they care about. Um, in addition to the amazing people that I get to work with, like you, Ben, and now both of you. <laughs> well, I would I'd love to circle back to some more sort of uh, Yamaha specific questions. But one thing that many of us are are teaching in programs that have some sort of music business program under some various name, commercial music, music business, whatever it is. Um, and to me, it seems like most most music career paths are pretty clear cut, not necessarily easy. But if you want to be an orchestra musician, uh, you go to a school like Curtis and you practice a lot and you go take an audition until you win it. Or if you want to be a high school band director, you go through a music education program, get certified, interview for a job. Um, to me, music business, music industry careers seem less clear cut. Um, could you enlighten me? Am I wrong in that? Or uh, what was your path to get there and any advice for prospective uh, graduates? Yeah, that's a that's a big question. I I don't think you're wrong in thinking that, or I don't think that's a mis um, a misperception by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's a really vast path, right? Like there's lots of ways that you can take music business, and I think um, that scares a lot of students because there isn't a clear cut path or there isn't a point A to point B necessarily. But for some students, and I think I fell into this um, category, it actually took a lot of the pressure off to know that there were lots of opportunities, there were lots of paths that this could take and those paths could end up in performance and education as well. Um, you know, when I started uh, university, I was, you know, stuck in this, like I grew up in a very small community and I knew that if I wanted to pursue music, it was performance or education. And I fell into this path where I was, I knew I didn't wanna perform um, because of a whole slew of reasons, including never having really worked through performance anxiety, I didn't want to, you know, spend my life in a piano practice room by myself. I wanted community and I wanted to, to do things with other people. And I knew I didn't want to teach full time. And so I really struggled with this idea of I really love music, but if I can't do either of those things, there's really not a place for me to study music. And so I was thinking about all these different career paths, like do I study graphic design? Do I go into business? My dad was a small business owner and entrepreneur. So I was I grew up around that, that type of um, thinking and around small businesses. Um, and so as I started researching and looking into uh, majors, I kind of landed on, no, I really do love music. And there surely there is a way for me to figure this out. Um, I went into university as a piano performance major with the mindset that I probably would not stay that. Um, and I'll come back to this in a minute because I think there's benefit um, for students coming in to either not declare a major or to declare something with the mindset that you may change it or it's okay to change what you decide you want to do, especially coming in to university at, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, your brains are still forming and there's so much that you have yet to learn. And I think that making such a monumental decision of what you're going to study and then trying to path your career out from there put so much pressure on someone so young um, to kind of figure out where you go. I have two older brothers. They both knew what they wanted to do in high school and followed those career paths from point A to point B. And so that not really knowing how I was gonna get from point A to point B um, felt uh, unnerving maybe would be the word I would use. Um, and so I, you know, I started um, as a piano performance major in the university that I went to had music business, a music business program. And that was intriguing to me. I had no idea what that meant, um, had no idea what that, you know, could path me to down the road. Um, and so coming in piano performance allowed me to explore a little bit. And I was still in the, the department of music, but it allowed me to take some other classes and really ask some questions of um, upperclassmen and of alumni as well. I think curiosity is one of the best traits that you can um, try to come into college with, but also cultivate as you're going through study. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're right. There's not a clear cut path from point A to point B. Like I said, I think that is exciting to some people and takes some of the pressure off because there's a lot of exploratory things you can be doing, especially if you're a college student, but it can also feel, um, uh, it, it can also feel a little 
aimless in some ways. And so that curiosity element, I think, is really what comes into play, especially if you're a college student, to be able to ask questions, to, you know, research all the all the jobs. There are hundreds of jobs that exist in the music industry. And I think where I landed um, after a little bit of time and asking questions was, oh, there, there are people that do everything for a music company. You know, there's there's a accountants right in any music music business there are accountants there are people that do marketing there are people that that run the organization from a very high strategic level who are leaders and thought thought leaders there are um you know there there are all these different types of people that exist to make a business run and sometimes those businesses have to do with music and so that you know that can translate to the film industry if you really love film but you also are really, really good at finances and at math. That's awesome. Be an accountant or a finance person for a film company. They need people who love film or music. You know, in our case, we need people who love music and understand music, but are also really, really good at numbers or are really, really good at leading people and getting people to do what needs to be done. And so I think that once I kind of understood that, and that came, like I said, through a lot of curiosity and asking questions, I really understood that the, that the path was really vast and that I could find my um, kind of area of expertise within the industry. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, yes, <laughs> um, yes, but I think, <laughs> okay, good. But I think, yeah, it is vast. I don't think that that perception is incorrect. And, you know, there's a lot of people trying to help um, place uh, resources out there of like, you know, um, Dave Gerhart, who I work with at Yamaha, who was a Yamaha artist before he became an employee of ours. He has a great talk and he throws up this slide of like over a hundred jobs in the industry that, that people most often would not even think about existing. And I was lucky to have someone who kind of shared something similar to that with me in college that really opened my mindset. And even with that, I didn't know that artist relations existed. So <laughs> there's always <laughs> something new to explore. <laughs> gotcha. Well, one question, actually, I, I kind of like to couple with this. Um, and I actually asked Bill Kahn this question when we were talking about Nexus. Uh, and he was starting this sort of, you know, at the time, what seems like just this crackpot chamber percussion group. But what did your parents think of all this? Like, I think parents <laughs> like when there's a clear cut career path. And I think that that slide you said from Dave that has 100 different career options would probably help put most parents at ease. But what 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 was the parental support situation like? <laughs> Yeah, that is such a great question. And I, and, you know, can't be underscored enough because I am super lucky. I'm super fortunate to have grown up in a family that was really supportive of whatever we were exploring and what we wanted to do. Um, my brothers are both in artistically minded um, kind of uh, industries, the film industry and architecture. And then my younger sister is in education. She's an amazing educator, but a little bit more clear cut path as opposed to some of the others. And, um, you know, I, even, even being in the uncertain mindset of I'm going to study music, I'm going to go in piano performance. For me, you know, if I had children right now, I'd be like, you're going to what? <laughs> but they, you know, they knew that I was on my way to something and that I had that kind of curiosity element to me. So they, I literally don't remember them ever saying, you know what, I don't, I don't know about that. They were super supportive. I, you know, I went to university and because I was communicative with them too, I think that helped. I took every opportunity that I had to expand my area of study. I was very fortunate to be in a program that required um, classes from the School of Business um, and not just were, you know, in the music department offering music business classes, but actual like business classes from the, the School of Business, which I think really helped. And we can talk about that a little bit more too, but I'm really fortunate that they were, that they were really supportive. And I think that allowed um, the pressure to come off of having to worry about what comes next. Now that happens, right? You get to your last semester of college and everyone wants to know, oh boy, you know, what are, <laughs> so music marketing, what are you going to do with that? And, you know, not really having an answer to that question, but I was really fortunate to, to have really supportive parents and a really supportive family in general. So, um, I wanted to ask about uh, getting to this job, but through an even less clear cut path of not having studied uh, music business or industry. Um, let's say that I want to get your job one day. Uh, so I am a performer, I'm a professor, obviously I can hold a job, right? Sort of something, I work in a community, I work with artists, uh, I am interested in education and all these things, but I have never taken these business classes. I might have my own projects that I run, you know, a festival or a competition, so some things to show for, but I did not get a music business degree or an industry degree. 
what do you suggest? How do I pivot? That's a such a good question. Um, and I think the pivot is is a really good question now. I think coming out of the out of COVID, especially, there are a lot of even I did, you know, ask some questions about where, what am I doing and what do I want to change? I think COVID offered us all a pause moment to, you know, to ask some of those questions. The pivot is, is interesting because I think, and I think this is um, accurate of college students too. It's all about the experience you have and how you relate that to potential experience in a job. Um, th this is just my perspective on it, but I was able to, coming out of college, I had been a part of a program that um, where I manage student artists, I produced student EPs, and I put to, helped put together a 10-day tour of um, bands that we had kind of formulated as students. And that was experience that though it was not like real world job experience where I was being paid to do something, it was, ex it was experience that I was able to, to draw upon to say, here's, here's something you're telling me you need me to do in this job. And here's experience that I have doing something similar. And I see that as an opportunity to grow upon the skills that I already have. And I think that that's probably the best piece of advice, especially when it comes to pivoting is pulling on the experiences that you have in order to say this relates, this might not be exactly the same, but I have experience that I can grow upon then with, with your guidance and with your mentorship. And then, you know, additionally, like doing the research and studying um, on your own. I'm a, a creature of constant study. Um, I read a lot. You know, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to um, a lot of books on tape too, like audiobooks while I'm walking. And I think that habit has helped me be able to continue learning and growing to take on new challenges in my work as well. And so I think that's one, just that constant element of curiosity, I think is, is the other element of that, that I would throw out there. Do you have like a favorite top three, top five, something like that books, podcasts, anything that, that you think anyone that's interested in this should check out? Uh, oh boy, that's a hard question. On the spot. I, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, on the spot. No, it's so good. So one of the books, I think that changed my whole perception when I was um, studying in college was Seth Godin's Purple Cow. Um, I, I like preach that book like it's the gospel. It's just such an interesting perspective on how to stand out, but not necessarily just how to stand out, how to help other people understand why they need your uniqueness and your, your offerings. And so I think that the idea of being unique and offering something unique has to be coupled with helping people understand why they need that. Um, and that book really helped me just, um, I think, realize the ways that I was unique and think a little bit outside the box. So Purple Cow is one that I recommend to everybody. Um, podcast wise, I love storytelling. And I think that's what um, helps make me really good at my job in AR is listening to stories and being able to share my own. Um, so I really love podcasts like This American Life and the Moth Radio Hour. Um, you know, there's a lot of people I work with that would be amazing Moth Radio Hour guests if they ever have the opportunity. Um, that's definitely one of my favorites. And then I just picked up, it's actually on my bookshelf back here, um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. I listened to, uh, he did an interview on Brene Brown's podcast that I like, I was putting together my desk while I was listening to it. And I kept having to like stop and pause and rewind and write something down. Um, so if you're ever listen, like looking for one episode of one podcast, that one just like knocked my socks off in terms of how we build habits and the importance of them and how, how you start from something so small in order to create a long lasting habit, as opposed to, you know, somebody who's like, I'm going to go run a marathon. And so I'm going to start running, you know, 10 miles right now. Like no one builds a habit that way. And so he gives actual detailed steps for how you build a long lasting habit. So I'm excited to dig into that one next. That's on my on my docket. I just wanted to say before we move on from this, how excited I am that you also like This American Life and uh, the Moth <laughs> because they're so good and I've been listening to both for so long. Um, I also just Googled real quick when you mentioned Purple Cow, I was like, what is that? And I wanna share the <laughs> subtitle of this book is Transform Your Business by Being Remarkable by Seth Godin. And now I feel like I need to um, order that right away because it sounds really enlightening. So thank you. Good. You're welcome. And it's such an easy read. I mean, it's so small. I, you can get through it in probably an hour, hour and a half, which I, is also the key for me. If I can get through a book quickly, I'm more apt to read it. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, this, I think, sort of falls under the same umbrella, but uh, there are many schools that, for whatever reason, uh, sorry, there are many skills that, for whatever reason, aren't covered in school. And actually, I wanted to give a shout out to Ksenia here, because as far as being like, a percussion soloist and doing all these things. Ksenia has like the whole, like having a good website, having good recordings, all that 
figure it out and it's so inspiring to me so thank you send you for that uh but jalissa in terms of music business what are some of the things that you know weren't taught in school that you kind of had to figure out on your own that's such a good question i so i came out of university um at a time where music business was maybe not uh as top of mind as it is now or was not in as many programs as it is now i think this is um a trend you know even at yamaha that we're noticing and and we're you know fortunate to be able to be a part of the industry at this time or i'm fortunate to be in the industry at this time where this is really becoming a, a hot topic of conversation um so the program that i was in was a very separated program i have a i have a degree in music marketing what that means credit wise was i had a music major and a marketing minor my classes did not overlap in any way, shape or form. That helped me in some ways and did not help me in others. In some ways it was awesome because I was taking like real business classes. And so I was in the school, I was part of the school business. I was there with folks who have gone on to take over major companies all over the world, um, learning the ins and outs of business bar none. So that for me was helpful because when I graduated, um, not knowing that I was going to get the job I did, I was ready to just start in ground level, entry level marketing position outside of the music industry just to gain experience. So I was ready. I was able, you know, I would have been able to step into one of those jobs, which I think helped me in terms of, you know, been to your point with my parents being able to say like, I can get a, I can get some job, like I will be okay, don't worry. Um, and then the, the music classes also have helped me now in the job that I have because I can communicate with musicians on a level that says I've, I've been there, like I've studied theory, I've studied, you know, music history, I've, I've spent hours and hours and hours in a practice room, I know what it's like to be a music major and have to give a recital and do the juries, you know, that whole experience I do think is important, especially if you're working in the music industry with musicians um, on some level to be able to speak that language as a musician is important. What I wish I had was kind of that overlap. And so I was really fortunate. My university was a part of a program of kind of like a coalition of various small universities that had these programs all over the, the world that um, highlighted very specific areas. So there was a program at, that they partnered with Oxford to study literature. There was a film studies program in LA and I did the music industry studies program just south of Nashville. And that was the program that allowed me the experience then to put on my resume that I had managed student artists. I had helped produce EPs. I had put together a tour. I had done marketing for that 10 day tour. Um, and so that was that was kind of the intersection for me and where I started exploring career paths within the industry. And they brought in guest speakers and lots of folks that we were able to ask a lot of questions of. I think that intersection, this is like the one thing that I personally believe um, lots of universities maybe miss the mark on and not necessarily miss the mark on, but don't see the opportunity for those two schools to intersect or even for the business school to interact with any fine arts program, right? The, the film studies program, the media communications program, the writing program, any of those students heading into any, any um, job in the industry need those business skills. And so I think that the larger like thing that I, opportunity that I see maybe missed most often is, and I say this to every college student I meet, um, music, music student that I meet is, take as many classes as you can from the School of Business. You know, take Accounting 101, take Marketing 101, take um, Business Law, especially um, now in this day and age, that's a hugely important if class if you can fit it in and if you can get in. And so I think even from the university standpoint, if there was more collaboration between those groups, I think we'd be seeing students come out with some pretty remarkable skill sets to be able to, to manage things themselves because too now um, student, especially students who are graduating are expected to manage themselves and be their own booking agent and be their own advocate. And to be your own advocate takes a lot of kind of self-awareness and empowerment that comes from really knowing what you're talking about. So I think, I guess from my experience learning that those two entities were really helpful in their own ways. And I just needed that intersection a little bit more. Um, I was able to get that because I sought it out, but I think if we gave students that opportunity, um, or maybe even forced them to have that opportunity, <laughs> I think they would be, um, you know, set for the future. Sorry, that was a little rambly. <laughs> I feel no, passionate it, about that one. It's it's great. I wanted to build on that and ask about um, the kind of marketing jobs that are out there now. I've been looking at Musical America and seeing that 
the biggest trend seems to be to work in social media for various institutions. And uh, I rarely would see a salary range posted, but I did see a couple of months ago, the Met was looking at a social media manager and their salary was 150 to $160,000 which, I mean, that's New York money. Um, you know, it, it, it goes differently than if you live somewhere else. But um, what is the trend and how are you, for example, since you graduated, what, it's 10 years ago and social media trends have largely changed. How are you supposed to, if you're applying for one of those jobs, how are you supposed to demonstrate that you're good at that? You obviously couldn't have taken a class because it didn't exist back then. I don't even know if there's right. TikTok for musicians now at Berkeley or somewhere, you know, some forward thinking institution. But how do we handle that, the social media part of it? That is such a great question. And I don't know if I have a great answer to that question. I was just talking to somebody about this recently, actually, we we're, um, you know, talking about kind of marketing plans and strategy. And, um, and I said, when, when I was form, I had taken up, it was called promotion strategies course, I think through the school of business. Um, and I loved that class because it was super creative in nature. And it allowed me to really explore the creative side of the business um, sector. And I remember my professor saying, now, do not focus your promotion strategy and your marketing plan on social media because that is like something that's here. It should it should be part of it, but definitely not the, the majority of your plan. Um, and fast forward to like, you know, here we are now. I'm like, boy, <laughs> you know, I think that's still accurate. I don't think it's the entirety of a, of a marketing or a strategy, a marketing plan or strategy, but it is a much bigger part than I think any of us would have dreamed it would be 10 years ago. I'm also not a super active person on social media. But I do know, you know, there's, I have a lot of feelings about creating personal brand, especially when it comes to being an artist. Um, I talk with students a lot about kind of the, the persona that they're creating online. We have my, my boss, John, always talks about the, the digital version of ourselves and the in-person version of ourselves. We all have digital personas if we're anywhere online, right? Like even if you're trying to stay offline and somebody else has created it for you, it exists. That's something that's a little inevitable at this stage. And I always say to students who ask if they should have an online presence because they don't really want to, I always tell them that's their choice, but that you can kind of serve, you can serve that purpose by having your digital persona, which can feel different maybe than, um, than your in-person persona. You can kind of sell, like it's why people have stage names, right? Like you kind of sell this persona as opposed to yourself, which can feel a little sticky. Um, so I think there's there's ways you can go about um, uh, putting yourself online and this dabbles into a lot of philosophy stuff. So I won't, I won't get too into the weeds here, but I think the way that we present ourselves online, um, that's a big topic. But if you're if you're going for a social media position, I I would never because I just like it's not a world I want to live in. But I think you definitely have to have something to show. And I, I there are lots of classes on this now at university um, because if you're really going to if you're going to go for a social media position, there's so much content strategy and understanding. I, you know, even like you post it this time on this day to get this many viewers. I know nothing about that. I'm not going to lie to you. I know nothing about that. Um, we have, uh, I have a lot of colleagues that know a lot more about that than I do, thankfully. Um, but I think it all comes down to like deciding what persona you're going to have online. And if that's the career path that you want to take, there's lots of ways to study it um, in a way that allows you very similar to marketing or management strategy that you have actual, um, things to know now that there's enough analytics tied to it um, that didn't exist for sure when I was in school um, and so I think that's part of why it wasn't um, not that it wasn't a valid part of a strategy but there weren't analytics to really put behind it where you could say this is this is um, the the biggest part of our strategy that we possibly could invest in and this is not a great answer to your question but it's just a world I don't I don't live so much in <laughs> It's all good. I'm I'm glad that you mentioned that it's okay to have your like online persona, your social media public persona and your personal persona, persona of course, how you are in day-to-day in -day life. Um, I'm teaching a class this semester. It's called Career Navigation for the Artist Teacher for DMA students. And there are a couple of people in that class who are less into social media than some of us and, you know, are a little resistant. And, um, you know, a lot of the class has been geared towards how do become as competitive as possible for academic jobs and 
you know, the, the truth is sometimes committees, sometimes people are relying on social media or your web presence or, or like that's how they can get to know you. Um, so I think it's important to think about you don't have to, you know, become obsessed with social media, but you could mm -hmm. create an account, you know, on Instagram, put some recordings, some, you know, here's almost think of it as a, as another format of a resume. Here's some things I'm doing. And that is your public mm -hmm. social media persona. And that's okay. And that's helpful. Yeah. But, I think that's a really important point because you also, we also have control over what goes out and, you know, very similar to, to a resume. I think there's benefit in putting out like some of yourself and maybe guarding the rest of it. Um, that's for me personally, that's how I live my social media life is I, I put some of myself out, but not the whole of me. So if you know me in person, you're going to know way, way more than anyone else is going to know, uh, just because I think it's important to have those guards up. Right. I mean, we're always trying to present ourselves in the best way possible on social media. Nobody's like, oh, last night I was crying in the bathroom by myself. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <about> that. <laughs> Not no that questions. it was. <laughs> but Jalissa, I, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, there are more and more programs today for music business and, um, various levels of music engineering or one of the programs we have at Shenandoah is music production and recording technology. Um, there are more and more like academic career paths that you can take as an undergraduate um, that prepare you for various roles. And for the most part, they all have a pretty heavy course load uh, as far as lessons and ensemble, um, whether it's large ensemble or small ensemble and maybe four or six or even eight semesters of private lessons. And I wonder what your take is on what would be most valuable. Why do these students need to take lessons and what is the most valuable part of them that they might get to take into a career in music business or maybe engineering or production? Mm -hmm. That's such a good question. And I've talked with this uh, about this with a lot of artists um, because on, on some level, it seems like why, why, and on a very granular level, why would we spend money on that in, at the university level if we're gonna end up over here? But I think, I, I don't think it is at all um, argued that the discipline we learn as musicians when it comes to practicing on our own, studying, fine tuning, perfecting our craft is applicable to anything that you could end up doing in life. Even when it comes to interpersonal relationships, like that all comes into play, right? That's not argued. And that I think I have seen maybe more than anything that I studied come through in my work, the work ethic that it takes to spend hours upon hours in a practice room or hours with an ensemble. And the ensemble part two, to, to take that then into working with a team and how maybe I don't really enjoy spending time with that person who plays this instrument over there and that person who sings over there, but we have to work together in order to form this um, beautiful sound. And it's, I mean, that is totally translatable into working with any form of any team um, is, is being able to come together with differing views and opinions and personalities and finding a way to work together to create, whether it's to create sound or to create a business plan, um, you have to work alongside people. And so I think those two things, you know, in terms of maybe, um, uh, lesson study or private private studio related work and, and ensemble work. I, I honestly, I think it benefited me more than even some of the classes that I took because that work ethic is undeniable, especially for musicians at the university level when you're really, you know, putting in those hours that comes that comes into play regardless of what you end up doing in life, I think. I love to hear that. And I, I have to assume also that it's helpful to know just what it feels like to be performing, what it feels like, like the preparation, what um, you know, I don't know the kind of questions you can ask an artist just before they perform or no, really, it's okay if we wait until after that sort of thing, like just what the whole mm -hmm. process is like. Mm -hmm. That's a, a huge point. And I think too, in my little world of artist relations, to be able to speak that language, you know, to your point of being able to know what it feels like to even, even just to the granular level of knowing what it feels like to sit in a practice room and you're going on hour three and you've gotten up to maybe get water, use the restroom and like eat a snack, but you haven't seen another human in those three hours or you've not interacted with another human. 
to be able to understand the whole scope of what it means to be a musician in AR, I think is really important. And that's why I took years off of playing when I graduated because I was so burnt out. And once I got back into playing, I could speak so differently to the artists I was working with. And so it just became even more, um, it resonated so much more that that is a really, really important piece of, and I think that resonates regardless of the position that someone might have in the music business industry. If you're working at a dealer and you're, you've got students coming in, maybe they're elementary level or high school level students, to be able to speak to them on the level where you understand either maybe where they're trying to go with their career and their, maybe their dream is to become principal trumpet of X, you know, of X um, symphony and you know that path that it's gonna take to get there, to be able to communicate with them on a different level, um, that, that matters in the business world. Um, that little connection and the ability to have a different kind of conversation with somebody I think really matters. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Julissa, to, to change topic a little bit, we've talked a lot about how, how to get to your job in the music industry, but we haven't talked too much about your, your actual job. Um, so I guess I'll ask a, a two-parter question here. Can you tell us about a typical workday, uh, you know, especially post COVID, what, what your Monday through Friday, nine to five looks like, as well as what I'll call an atypical workday. So I'm assuming at some point there's some sort of travel involved, whether it's to a conference or to Yamaha Japan. Um, so what's your typical and atypical workday like? This is an amazing question. And I kind of chuckle every time I'm asked it because the, the thing I love most about my job is that there's not a typical work day. Um, working with artists means like, you know, you can get one phone call that just like completely blows up what you had planned for your day. And I love that because we're basically professional problem solvers. So I can, you know, if I were to have a typical work day, it would include, you know, a few meetings with either artists or with my marketing colleagues or sales colleagues, um, or, you know, various folks within the organization, in addition to artists outside of the organization or prospective artists. And so I schedule all of those things. And then I schedule time to work on maybe projects that are ongoing or long-term. That's another kind of like thing in AR is like we, there's never like really an end date to projects because they're always, it's just constant, right? It's cyclical in nature, which, which I love. Um, and so the most days I spend a good chunk of the day on the phone, um, a good chunk of the day doing email. Um, I uh, am fortunate to manage about 800 artists um, on the band and orchestral roster. So brass, woodwind, strings, and percussion, um, in addition to a few other responsibilities, which, um, which I kind of squeeze into the cracks. But I, you know, that that's why I love my job is the people that I get to work with. And so typical day would be spending most of the day on the phone um, and most of the day doing email in addition to some of those meetings. Now, like I said, that can all be thrown out the window with one phone call with one artist saying, you know, my if clarinet I, just got run over by a train. Yeah, if, no, go ahead. If I can jump in for a second, since you, you mentioned it, yeah. we're all like 800 artists. Oh my, like, <laughs> no, your faces. That was I, I just, yeah, I just wanted to mention though, that like when, when I was sort of dealing with getting, uh, be, you know, becoming a Yamaha artist, um, yeah, it was not like, it, it was unlike any other company I've ever dealt with. I talked to John and Jalissa at Yamaha on the phone for probably two hours in one day. So I don't, I don't understand how you can do that with 800 people, but you know, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to that point, we're really lucky and we really run on the philosophy that we're in it for the long haul. So we really try to find people who are going to be with us for, you know, hopefully decades. We're really fortunate to have some artists who've been with us 40 years. Um, and so not all of those are, you know, most recent signs um, for sure. A uh, lot of longevity on our roster. And we're really, really lucky to have that. But yeah, it's a, it's not a small number. <laughs> we're a very small team. We're the little engine that could trying to keep track of everybody and what they're doing. But that's why I say I spend most of my day on the phone, um, either talking to prospective artists or, um, or artists that are already in our family and deep those relationships, which makes the travel so much more meaningful. So when I actually get to sit with someone in person and, you know, been meeting you at Paysec last year or, you know, talking with artists at, at various trade shows or scheduling an actual trip to just sit with an artist, that happens from time to time too. It makes those, those, those times where we're face-to-face -face, um, just so much more exciting. Um, and so that's why I'm saying like, you know, I can plan all of that. And even, you know, those phone calls that I have planned sometimes just 
uh, you know, either go way long because we're just talking and it's so natural and it feels so good. And we're in this really deep conversation and it's so meaningful. And then sometimes, you know, like I was, was about to say, I'll get a phone call from somebody who's like, my clarinet was just run over by a train, or I have this video shoot and I didn't realize that I was going to need a soprano saxophone in addition to my tenor saxophone, or I'm, you know, going to do this marimba concerto, but I don't, I can't obviously throw my marimba in my backpack and take it on the plane with me. Can you help me out? So there's like those phone calls that come in that just need to be addressed really quickly. And so that kind of, you know, takes precedence. And so the big part of my job is kind of prioritizing what actually has to happen very quickly, what's really important. You know, the, I don't know if you guys have seen the the grid of priority and importance um, and yeah, urgency. My, my um, taught me that's called a Punnett square, apparently. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> urgent, yeah. Not, urgent, so, important, not important. Yeah. That is pretty much how I live my day is like, what square does this go into and how fast do I need to, to react to it? So there's a lot of reactionary elements to my job. Um, and then the proactive elements, you know, we try to schedule in as best we can, but I've been, you know, really lucky pre pandemic, I traveled a ton. And I, that was like the best part of my job is being able to actually sit face to face with either colleagues or artists. And then the pandemic hit and that all went out the window. I was on the road a ton before the pandemic, you know, it's up several times a month. And depending on the time of year, you know, it might be all four weeks of October into like two weeks in November and two weeks in December, and then most of January, or it could be, you know, nothing for a month. And then, you know, being on the road for a few months after that. So it's very, um, kind of ebbs and flows based on convention season and the specialty shows, you know, there's like PASIC for percussionists, there's there's a show like that or three for every other product group that we oversee, um, which is really fun. So I do a lot of traveling to trade shows um, in addition to just um, trips, literally just to sit and have coffee with an artist and talk about a really big topic that needs to be addressed. Um, or, you know, John and I try to schedule a couple trips to New York every year because we have such a concentration of artists in New York and LA, obviously. Um, and so we just schedule like, you know, 10 meetings a day with as many artists as we can um, while we're there, come home super exhausted, but full and happy. <laughs> uh, those are my favorite trips for sure. Um, so yeah, it just kind of depends on the season. We're headed into that busy season. PASIC usually kind of kicks off the fall um, in, into the winter season of, of busyness. Um, so we're just getting started, which is exciting. And coming out of the pandemic, getting back to seeing people, I'm sure much like, you know, getting back to being in person with students or playing in front of real human audiences again, being able to sit with our artists has been, um, I, I think a good reminder of why we do what we do. Um, that energy that you feel when you're sitting with someone face to face is unmatched for sure. Well, I know that one of your sort of personal values and also a value of Yamaha is uh, like diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I was wondering if you could enlighten us. Why, why is that a, uh, a thing that is important? I think we all have agree, but <laughs> to be clear, but, <laughs> but why, why is that a personal value of yours? And, and what does that mean in the field of music? Yeah, this, I love this question. And I think probably like most people, I've had a lot of time to think about it over the last few years. And we actually, so I've been uh, really lucky to be on a small film team. Um, we made a documentary during the pandemic called The Sound of Us. And it um, tells the nine different stories of the power of music and how it uniquely uh, unifies us as humanity and has for all of time and probably will for you know forever to come and uh so my one of my other bosses chris um is the director of the film and kind of helped put the the storylines together he um he said this thing while we were creating the film about our responsibility to one another through music and how music uniquely provides us or gives us um, a responsibility to celebrate each other well and to, to, to showcase each other well. And that really has stuck with me for the last couple of years. And so that's really where I come back to when I think about diversity is a huge topic, right? It's super expansive. It is not all inclusive because there's lots of other elements of inclusion and equity that come along with talking about diversity. But I think the unique thing about music um, and why I think it's really um, maybe uniquely powerful when it comes to music is that we have the ability to connect, I think, with folks who think differently, feel differently, um, look different, um, sound different to us. I think we have a unique way of connecting with each other through music than, than pretty much anything else. You know, you even think about sports, like there's lots of sports teams, lots of different sports, but it's really hard. You know, I'm a big Detroit Red Wings fan. It's really hard for me to connect 
with someone who is like an opposing team. Whereas music, even if it's different genres, um, different schools of thought, different ways to hold the things that you're creating music with, I think it really um, affords us a unique opportunity to connect as humanity. And so I think that carries over to like every industry everywhere. But the idea that it's important for us to be surrounded by a diverse landscape, whether that's music or political views or views on how we treat humanity. I think music offers us such a unique ability to connect with other people, um, you know, and hear them in a different way. And it's really hard to explain, but I think um, it's, it's our responsibility to humanity to highlight and showcase and celebrate um, difference in musicality, if that makes sense. Well, I love hearing that and especially thinking about um, the power of representation and the way that companies like Yamaha and like many of the, the major music companies and percussion companies have to highlight and elevate voices that really affect, you know, from an educational level and business level too, I'm sure as consumers, like who is involved in this type of music and in what types of music it's, it's really, really powerful. So I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear all of your thoughts on this and, and your value of diversity. Thanks. Yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot to talk about on that topic for sure. And I know we don't have time necessarily to go super deep into it, but I do think, you know, just like I think it's important to surround yourself with people who think differently about the world and about humanity in order to broaden scope and learn from each other, that exists in, in music too, you know, to elevate, like, like you were saying, to elevate um, various um, voices and sounds. And I think, you know, with the film, that was one thing that was really important to us was the idea of passing the mic and letting someone else share their story. And I think that, you know, when it comes to equity, that's like, for some of us, that's, that's the most important thing we can do is to stop talking or to stop making sound and pass that microphone to somebody else. And that, um, that kind of like sensitivity that it takes or vulnerability that it takes to just like, um, for lack of a better word, to like shut up and give someone else the mic is is just as important as voicing your own perspective and opinions. And I think that was like one of the biggest things I've learned in the last few years was the um, the need to just stop um, talking or stop making sound and just listen and kind of quiet oneself and hear from other people. Jalissa, yeah. you, we, we have mentioned several times John Whitman, and uh, I would hate it if we didn't talk about John here. <laughs> we spoke with John not, not too long ago, a few months ago, um, and we were just so impressed by his calm demeanor and wisdom. It's like, it's like speaking to a, a monk, basically. I mean, he is just brilliant. <laughs> so can you, can you tell us what, what it's like to work with John Whitman? Oh, my God. Word. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we got all night. <laughs> yeah, a monk. Yeah, that's a really good word. He's he is my Yoda. You know, no question. He is. Um, I am. I count myself among the most lucky people on planet Earth to work for and with John. John really took a chance on me. I you know credit most of who I am today and um, where I've come in the industry to John and his mentorship and his guidance. Um, I remember he he was so intimidating to me when I sat down in my first interview because he's tall and he's bald and he's got these cool glasses and you know you know that he's like really important in the industry so I was sitting there like you know terrified and he he said to me we've interviewed probably 40 people that are way more qualified than you are why should I hire you and thankfully I'd been asked that question in a mock interview so I was really prepared with an answer and I, I genuinely said to him I I am a sponge. I'm just starting out. I have so much to learn. And so with me, maybe compared to your other candidates, you'd be getting someone that you can mold and morph and mentor into the type of person you really need by your side in the industry. And I think he's really done that. You know, it's been a little over 10 years that I've worked with, um, with him and alongside him and for him. And he, I, you know, 10 years into knowing someone, you kind of sometimes might think, what else could I possibly learn from you? It's time to learn from someone else. And I'm always looking to learn from other people too. But every time I sit with John, I learn something new or every phone call that I'm on with him, I'm just ingesting how he's approaching the topic. He, like Ben, you said, he, the calm demeanor, that is John to a T. Even when he's frustrated and upset, he is so calm and so chill. And you would never know until you get off the phone and maybe get a phone call, what is happening? But he just presents himself in a way that I hope to emulate with everyone that I come in contact with. And I feel 
I, I would not be anywhere near where I am in the industry without him championing me and, and bringing me alongside him um, in some of the biggest opportunities that he's had. Like in my first six months at Yamaha it was our 125th anniversary. And pr we produced this huge concert during NAM that year. And I would have never like six months out of the job, no one would have ever brought me onto that show. And John said, no, I, I do trust her. I think she's worth bringing on. And so I was able to help produce this massive concert or, you know, play a very small part in producing that concert. Um, and that has also helped me, you know, with relationships with many of my other colleagues now. And so I just, that he has such an, a unique ability to see um, unmet potential. I think like he, he can tell, he can see it. And that I think builds teams maybe even better than hiring the person who on paper is the right person for the job. He can, he can just see that like spark and, and draw the things out of someone that no one else can. I just, I mean, I could go on forever. John is, John's my hero. I love him to death. He's great. I'm, I'm just cracking up hearing you talk about how you were nervous based on his appearance because you you built him up to sound like he was Dr. Evil, but the, he looks exactly like <laughs> Howie Mandel. <laughs> he looks he exactly he like totally Howie does. Mandel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and he's such a teddy bear of a human. Like he is not like once you get to know him, he's so not intimidating and he's such a lovely person. But walking into the room when I was just like, you are like, you know, a music business god. I don't like how am I ever going to get the job? How am I going to land this? But he's just a teddy bear of a human. He's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Delissa. It's been uh, an honor to have you on the podcast and so much wonderful information. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone on episode 339. See you next week.